peace, 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 shalom, 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 assalamu alaikum, and welcome to another day to labor in the vineyard of the most high. With your brother, another day to get in the almighty glorious word to see what the most I got to see and what we eating on the day. Knowledge of the divine mother and the divine father and how the two in one permeates through everything in creation and how to receive our true blessing and our power in the step into Zion we gotta get past all the divisions and the mindset that's been installed in us by the conquerors all right so we're going to have to get a little bit of history and then we're going to get into the metaphysical things. But the two in one, the mother and the father, which makes the supreme, permeates everything in creation. Meaning the masculine and the feminine are hand in hand and together uh -huh. That's when you got the transformative power. But as long as you got brothers banging for the father, and then you only got you got the sisters banging for the mother, it's division. The two in one. And that's why I told y'all some years ago. I've been praying the mother, father, God for a few years. There's no separation. When they come, when I do my prayer, I speak to both of them. And at the same time, I know speaking to the two, I also speak to the others on the other side of the veil, who are the workers, like in the sealed portion when it tells us, the Father don't answer your prayers. Nah, it's your God that's been assigned to you. It's workers in the celestial realm, all right? But the two and one permeates through all of the angelic hierarchy. All them too, so we gonna have to tie them into the lesson too, cause it's a separate. The the white man then separated us from the entities on the other side, and some of us still a little hesitant because we think that it's wicked to participate in certain indigenous systems that we had that involve working with the entities on the other side of the veil, but it's not. That's just all part of the separation. All right? So we got to get the unity back between the fleshly beings and the light beings. And together, that's how we get the power and transform this kingdom. All right? All right? Let's see. I'm going to get a precept out the keys right quick before we get into the history. Because this going to line it up. It will precept out the keys and we're gonna come back to the keys later on. Page 413. Key 307. Starting at verse 93. At this time, the righteous will understand that just as the old testament was the age of the father. The New Testament was the age of the sun. This new age is the age of the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. the age of the Divine Mother. The feminine is time to rise back up. All right. So in the age of the Holy Spirit, the Divine Mother all of the brothers that's out here denying the mother 
it is no way that they can work with the spirit. Because the Shekinah, the Ruach, is a aspect of the Divine Mother. And when you following the white main doctrine of the Holy Spirit as a him or he, you 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 out of alignment. You out of you out of bounds. All right. And them brothers bang for that doctrine. All right. Because the spirit don't allow them to go outside of the doctrine. All right. They confined to the doctrine instead of flowing with the spirit. All right. And it, they they start to get phased out because as things progress, they they in the wrong time frame. It's like listening to some old pastors that taught in the sixties and seventies. They still working with their old doctrine, and a lot of our brothers in the camps is just like those pastors and priests. They working with doctrines. They not following and moving with the spirit, so they not growing. They stand in a certain box, just like the Gentiles. All right, but as we go on, you gotta follow the spirit. You gotta follow the mother, and she open you up and feed you more and more, so that your spiritual veil begins to be lifted. All right, and that's why she taking us through all these different books to give us back the pieces of the puzzle to open us up to see beyond the doctrine that was set up to get to us. All right. Let's see. The great cosmic mother rediscovering the religion of Earth. Alright. And if anybody got this book or decide to get it, you gotta know. The author that wrote it, it was a Gentile sister, and she was given the history, but at the same time. Due to her personal lifestyle, is a lot of that in the book. All right, she liked women, so throughout this book, it's a lot of perverse statements about the goddess. All right, and about the culture. But once again, Gentiles weren't there, so they didn't necessarily know our culture. All they can go off of is what they then put in their own studies and what they didn't get from different books of ours. But they put their own twist onto it, all right? The goddess and bisexual and, and gay, and it don't even go together, all right? Because the goddess has to work with the God. That's how creation continues. That's the two-in-one. The divine feminine and divine masculine make up the supreme, all right? And everything else trickles down from there. So to cut off the masculine, and when you if you read about her, she was part of the feminist movement. All right, so that's just a warning, uh, uh, something to pay attention to. If you got the book or get it, don't believe all of the gay references that's in here. Nah. All right, but at the same time, it was a Gentile that wrote it, and like the most I say, use whoever you want to, but you gotta have the spirit to just see beyond. Some of the influences of the Gentile mindset. All right, and this is a section called the original Black Mother. All right, so they told the truth. They told the truth in the book. The original mother is the melanated woman. All right, so let's start on page twenty-five to break up the ancient maternal kinship groupings. And the sacred life patterns they follow for the purpose of robbing the native people of their land, stealing the earth's raw resources, and exploiting human labor, the colonial armies sent the missionaries in to introduce the abstract and alien concepts of Father Right and of Father God, who was the enemy of the great mother. Christian missionaries preaching of the heavenly father and his son and Muslims carrying the message of Allah and his prophet Muhammad performed the same colonizing functions. They all put out the divine feminine. 
all right? And even though it's hidden in different aspects of the teachings, for the most part, all of these religions that set up, they done kicked out the mother, all right? And that's why in the Bible, they, they bang on Ishtar, and our Ishtar was an aspect of the divine mother, all right? They, they demonize it. Isis, I said, an aspect which she was, we're going to see later on in the lesson, she was the original highest aspect of the divine mother, all right? But the churches and the religions, they then kicked out the mother. They found the mother's people who were alive and well within the holistic now. And they denounced these people ways, speaking on the indigenous people, and redefined them as backwards children of a distant, distant, aloof, paternalistic, paternalistic power. All exploitation follows quite easily and self-righteously from such a redefinition. Colonial powers really convince themselves that they are doing their victims a favor, lifting them up from the earthly mother. Through whips, degradations, imprisonments, hunger, and slaughter. So they can glimpse through tears of far off shining palace, the abode of the heavenly father. Imperialist colonialism always sees itself officially as an instrument of spiritual enlightenment. What this means in practice is that the mother, the people's blood identity, is denounced in the name of some superior father God who always happens to live somewhere else. Because in maternal cultures, in maternal cultures, and remember, a few lessons ago, I told you, we had matriarchies, all right? And that's foreign to us these days, because all we know is this civilization that we've been a part of for so long, all right? But remember, the most I call this tribes, and tribes don't operate the way that we operate in this Gentile system here, nah. We had, we had different ways of our culture that was set up, all right? It won't, it won't set up the way that we live now, which separates everybody. Everybody separate individually and by little families. They're not the way tribes operate. They operate as a collective, all right? And the children belong to the village. It, it no, this my kid, don't say nothing to my child. No, no, no. We operated off of unity. It was a unity within the tribal unit. All right. Because in maternal cultures, the father is a social rather than a biological role. And because this father role is defined in terms of its relation to the mother, i.e. her brother or her uncle, this enforced redefinition brutally attempts to pull the ontological rug out from under all basic social relationships and the emotions surrounding them. We must consider the effect of this. In some matrifocal cut cultures, such as the pre-Aryan Toda people of India who practice palandry, a woman will choose one among her many husbands to be a social father for her child. The more common practice is for the mother's brother to act as social father. In these arrangements, the man acting as father must win the children's affection and respect. He cannot expect it as his right. All right? It won't no such thing as fatherless children and tribes. It was going to be a father one way or another. All right, it, it, it was always a male factor around because we did operate like the white folks do. All right, well, our family structure won't set up that way. Nah, just because you was the one used to have a kid 
The kid belonged to everybody. It did just, it, the kid belonged to the village. It belonged to the tribe. It was a child of the tribe. It wasn't a child of just this man and that woman. All right? And this is when we read scriptures, they 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 gloss over this aspect of our history. This this aspect of the history is not included. But the fact that it tell you that we operated in tribes, if you study tribal lifestyles and how the tribes and the matriarchal societies operated, it was completely different. The majority of the problems that we got now, it, it won't no way that we can hide them problems because of the way that the tribal structure was set up. In this European society, this is why we don't function properly and it cause mental, spiritual illnesses with us because it's foreign to our nature. They didn't, they didn't change the way we operate. Lucky, lucky eating though. After spending early childhood close to the mother's body, the young child then moves out into the group life guided by the social father. The child belongs to the whole people. The child belongs to the whole tribe and feels this belonging because he does not relate egotistically or possessively to the children. The social father is much better prepared to let his own nurturing talents develop truly. There is no question of property right because in this society, children are treated like property. Your wife is treated like property. Nah, nah, your, your flesh is not nobody's property. It's just the temple of the spirit. There is no question of property right personal ambition, economic responsibility, sexual jealousy, or social status involved in his relationship to women and children. These cultures are not perfect, but the notorious soap opera of Western domestic life is avoided. Most of all, these matrifocal cultures weave a web work of non-possessive intergroup relationships, non-possessive intertribal relationships, which supports a growing being through every phase and crisis of unfolding life. All right, there's always somebody around. Ain't ain't no kids growing up by themselves because their parents at work. When you operate in the tribal environment. Nah, it's always somebody there. A oh, big brother, big sister, auntie, uncle. It's always somebody else there. All right? Colonialism tries to rip this network apart with the artillery fire of patriarchal concepts. Concepts of women's inferiority, of misogynistic and anti-sex morality, of possessive fatherhood, of competitive greed and alienated individualism and of women, children, and land existing as the property of dominant males. A major rook involves splitting the human spirit away from the earthly mother and her cycles of her cyclic processes and forcibly reattaching this sundered spirit to the sky to some aloof and abstract source of dominance and power. A result of all this is the destruction of a people's blood memory, its past identity, especially since colonized people tend to keep oral histories, all right, and colonized people is speaking on the indigenous people, tend, we kept oral histories, and patriarchy and since that only written down history is real. Because ancient women's cultures existed everywhere, including Africa, and because Africa was originally matriarchal, there was a great deal of overlap 
in some of these studies, with most students reaching the same conclusion. Women, and furthermore dark women, were the originators of most of what we know as human culture. Truly, our very sanity is at stake with continuing patriarchy and the denial of the cosmic self, the goddess within us all and us within her. The great mother was the projection of the self-experience of groups of highly aware, highly conscious and productive women who were the founders of much of human culture. In this sense, the Great Mother is not simply a mental archetype, but a historical fact. Ancient icons, symbols, and myths cannot be understood if they are disembodied from this fact. Because the Great Mother was a historic reality her psychological suppression also must be seen in historical terms as a political suppression of an earlier female-oriented world order by a later male-dominated one. All right? So the sisters did, in the beginning, like we read in the time of the father, both of his children ran things. You had the men running in certain areas and you had the women running in certain areas. The same way you got alpha males, you got alpha females, all right? That's what we see in the lesson with Solomon and Makeda, also known as the Queen of Sheba, all right? She was the ruler of her kingdom. In the same way Solomon was the ruler of his kingdom. All right? You had a matriarchal society under Makeda, and you had the patriarchal society under Solomon. All right? But they both were strong kingdoms. All right? Ran in righteousness. All right? And as time went on, the daughters lost their power. Like if you read Isaiah chapter 3, when they talk about how the Most High had to punish the daughters of Zion. The daughters of Zion is the celestial daughters. The daughters of Jerusalem is just the colored sisters. The daughters of Zion is higher up on the totem pole than the daughters of Jerusalem. All right? The daughters of Zion are daughters of Jerusalem, but not all of the daughters of Jerusalem are daughters of Zion. All right, but in chapter three of Isaiah, the Most High talked about how he had to punish the daughters of Zion because of their vanity. And what do you see now? Oh, the sister's vanity is it, it, crazy. All right, vanity. Social media adds onto the vanity tenfold. All right. But that was why the daughters of Zion was punished. All right. Vanity. And they couldn't act because of that. They couldn't rule properly. All right. They couldn't stay in their place that they had been given. So the most High switched it and put the men on top. All right. And everything switched over. Everybody had their time to rule. All right. The women had their time to rule. The men had their time to rule. And then they ruled collectively together. All right, in the beginning, it was a collective. As time went on, the women ruled, then the men ruled, and at the end of time, it's coming back to the collective. All right? The sons and daughters of Zion is going to collectively reign in the end. All right? But because the sons had got raised up, that's what we get out of Isaiah 4. All right? And it's not speaking on polygamy when it talks about seven daughters of Zion to one to one man, no, nah, the one man is their teacher. That's why they say we don't need, let me go to it. Let me go to it. We gotta get rid of our perverted mindset. We gotta get rid of our perverted mind 
in our carnal, lustful mind that thinks everything got to do with the flesh. Isaiah chapter 4. And in that day, seven women should take hold of one man, saying we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, meaning they not living in the house with him. They not his, his wives, all right? Because in according to the law of Moses, you got to take care of your wives. You got to treat the first one like the second one and such and such. All right. So they're not speaking on them living with him because they said they eat their own bread and have their own apparel. Meaning they just need him to lift them up in the spirit. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. It's not talking about his last name. Your carnal last name cannot take about take away nobody's reproach. All right, being called by a man's name cannot take away a Roman woman's reproach. Reproach. The name is speaking on the attribute. All right. He sealed them with the name of the living God in their forehead. That's the only thing that can take away your reproach. All right. Is connecting you back to the source of your godliness. All right, which takes you away from the problems, the reproach. Of the flesh and carnal life. All right. So these seven women to this one man, they coming to be taught. All right. They coming to be sealed by the teachings to connect back to their Godhead. All right. And that's the same thing it's saying right here with the seven women saying, taking hold of one man. It's a righteous man, it's a spiritual man. All right. They're not taking hold of them in the flesh like come here. No. Nah. They saying, teach me. Saying, we will eat our own bread, meaning I don't need you to buy me nothing. I don't need you to give me nothing. Only let us be called by thy name. All right? Obviously, it's a spiritual brother. All right? The name is the name of the highest. All right? The spiritual brother is walking in the light. They want to be called by his name because only the light can take away their reproach. And that day, in that day, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. A man having many wives does not make the branch of the Lord glorious and beautiful. Especially if they got carnal mindsets. It's of no benefit. It's of no benefit to the most high. But if them righteous men can get through to the women... And seal the name of the living God in their forehead and elevate them, then everything starts to go back to how it was in the beginning. All right. In that day, said the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel, meaning those that came out of Babylon. Those that have left behind the carnal mindset and can see the light of the spirit. And it should come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remains in Jerusalem should be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away, when the Lord, this how you know in verse 1 is talking about the name being the name of the living God, the light. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth, the filth of the daughters of Zion. And let's go backwards. Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, Meaning vain, vanity, and walk with stretched forth necks. All right, and that I'm gonna line it up in the bottom of mine's where it got that it says that means walking in darkness. All right, and wanton eyes, meaning they have carnal eyes. All right, stuck on the affairs of the world, walking and missing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with the scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. Alright, so there go the punishment. Now pause. Let's go back to chapter 4. Verse 4. 
When the Lord shall wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion, meaning he done washed away their vanity and their carnality, their love of their self, and thinking that they run everything, all right, their pride, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory, upon all the glory shall be a defense. Because they start walking in righteousness again. And that's where the defense comes because the other part of the body those on the other side are your protection. All right? Oh, let's keep going. Let's keep eating. Let's go to the symbols. Let's go to the symbols. The first prophet, prophetess of mommy. Mommy water. Let's continue with the history as we start to transition to the spiritual aspect of things. For centuries, the Grecian islands at Delos, Dodona, Delphi, and the Temple of Mami in ancient Libya were the ecclesiastical and moral hub of religious, social, and international political activity. It was under the theocratic governance of the Sibyls as queen mothers that African matriarchal culture reached this golden age. African matriarchal culture reached this golden age of achievement in medicine, religion, astronomy, philosophy, law, architecture, music, art, and social Sophistication. Just as their divine African mother, Mommy Isis, all right, and this is speaking on our set from Kemet, all right? Remember, she is the highest image, the original image of the divine mother, all right? Our set, Isis. Just as their divine African mother, Mommy Isis, served as the first universal sacerdotal symbol of the divine celestial and terrestrial African ancestress, her worship as the manifestation of the Logos. And remember, in the Hebrew pantheon, Jesus is the Logos. So what it's saying right here, the divine feminine, our set, was the Logos. Her worship as the manifestation of the Logos was continued in Asia Minor and in Manoa and Massene. Archaeological pottery sites date the black descendants of Libyan, Garamantes, and other African clans who had settled into Babylon and elsewhere before the flood to have arrived in Manoa as early as 4000 BCE. Let's get a pre-sale. Let's go to page 32. The African gods, goddesses, heading these divine pantheons, Isis, Isis, Ayana, Ashtaroth, Atagetus, Sibel, Demeter, Hathor, Black Diana, who Wonder Woman was about, etc., were the major water deities who were known by many names in the theology of the Mami Wata tradition. They are descendants from the original Logos, which is known in Kemet as Isis or Aset. Isis is a divine concept which embodies this Logos as divine wisdom who is the Holy Spirit, which is an aspect of the Divine Mother. 
as the first African in ancestress. She is also recognized as the first divine queen, possessed of the full power, possessed of the full power of mommy. She herself was not God, but rather is divine wisdom, first divine crown manifestation in human form, who writes are known as Mami Water. Her name, just as that of Osiris or Asa in Horus or Haru, became synonymous with the Netzer. And we're going to read about the Netzer in a minute. And names Isis, Sybil, Mami Isi, and others are particularly common, commiserate with one initiated as a serpent water priestess. Serpent water priestess. Let's precept that. Let's go back to the great cosmic mother. And this section is called the cosmic serpent. All right, and we just read about that serpent priestess. Great live snakes were everywhere kept in the goddesses' temples during the Neolithic. All right? In wall paintings, bas relief statues, she was often represented carrying snakes in her upraised arms or coiled around her. Or she was imagined as a serpent herself with a woman's body and a snake's head. Of one Near Eastern goddess, it was said, Pagat, she who observes the water who studies the dew from the drop, who knows the courses of the stars, her heart is like a serpent. The Sumerian goddess was known as the great mother serpent of heaven. Perhaps another image of the Milky Way, the great spiraling galactic arms. Everywhere in world milk and energy, the goddess creatrix was coupled with the sacred serpent. In Egypt, she was the cobra goddess. The use of the cobra in her ceremonies and icons was so ancient that the inscribed picture of a cobra preceded the names of all goddesses and became the hieroglyphic sign for the word goddess. Isis also was pictured as a serpent goddess. Far away in Australia, the Aboriginal goddess Una, who established the earth, was pictured sometimes as three sisters with the rainbow snake held up in her arms. The snake was first of all a symbol of eternal life, like the moon. Since each time it shed its skin, it seemed reborn. It represented cosmic continuity within natural change, spiritual continuity within the changes of material life. Gliding as it does in and out of holes and caverns in the earth, the serpent also symbolized the underground, the abode of the dead who wait for rebirth. All right, that's in the book of Enoch and also the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. Its undulations symbolize the serpentine earth currents of the underground waters. The serpent path on earth was the terrestrial energy flow. The serpent path in the sky was the winding spray of stars in the galactic spiral arm or Milky Way. The goddess was also she who gives life to the dead. All right, just like the Holy Spirit, she get life to the dry bones. Aided by her magic serpent, who wins in and out of the earthly tomb or womb. The snake with this stylized image, the spiral, was seen as the vehicle of immortality and the image of spontaneous life energy, its continuous flow. The snake could shed its skin, but still live. 
as the moon birthed herself from her own darkness, and the womb bled periodically without being wounded. All were seen as miraculously interconnected transformations. To the serpent was attributed power that can move the entire cosmos. All right, and right here, we got an image. A bronze female head from benign Nigeria with snakes issuing from nostrils and birds on the head. In Africa, snakes issuing from the nostrils indicated clairvoyant powers. Snakes coming forth from the nostrils indicated clairvoyant power, doubtless related to the third eye, meaning no doubt being related to the third eye. The pineal gland behind the nose and the snake hair of Medusa had the same significance. All right, and you know how they teach Medusa is wicked, but nah, the snake hair of Medusa had the same significance. One legendary historic Medusa was an Amazon queen in the region of present-day Morocco. All right. According to Merlin Stone, snake venom has highly hallucinogenic qualities. Some venom is chemically similar to mescaline or the psilocybin of mushrooms. Reported effects were clairvoyance, extraordinary mental powers, enhanced creativity, prophetic visions, and illumination about the primal process of existence. As Stone remarks, the sacred snakes kept at the goddess's oracle shrines were perhaps not merely the symbols, but actually the instruments through which the experience of divine revelation were reached. And so the Egyptian Krober goddess was also known as the Lady of Spells. We can be sure the ancient women shamans were aware of this property of snake venom and that this was one of the recognized meanings of the snake symbols and images inscribed everywhere all right so the snake lines up with what we just read about the snake priestess all right let's keep eating let's go back to the symbols the prophetess and minwa and masane Later renamed Greece, it was under the theocratic governance of the Sibyls as queen mothers that African matriarchal culture reached its golden age of achievement in medicine, religion, astronomy, philosophy, law, architecture, music, art, and social sophistication. Under the same matriarchal sacerdotal aura, an era of high diplomacy, mutual co cooperation, and peace ensure, ensue. Uh, then I go another image. From 400 BCE, a red clay vessel of black Minoan priestess and corn rolled hair during Greek colonization. The entire cultural, religious, economic, and political substratum of what came to be credited as Greek culture was actually that of these black matriarchs who fled the patriarchal takeovers in Libya, Egypt, and Ethiopia. Together, they constructed massive temples dedicated to Mommy and all of her offspring whose authoritative influence and divine power extended to all four corners of the known world. 
It was in those sacred temples that the sibyls were offered their divine wisdom, healing, and prophetic counsel. As avatars, muses, vestals, and saints of the Mami waters, all divine power later attributed to the most highest male god and prophets was first accomplished by the priestesshoods headed by these holy African queen mothers. All right? But no, we had both. All right? We had both. All right? We had, mat we had male prophets and we had female. We had prophetess. All right? Just like in the Old Testament. It was prophetess in the Old Testament. But they don't get their credit. All right? Because by that time, patriarchy had took over. And the majority of the female prophets had got wrote out of the scriptures to conform to the patriarchy, the male-dominated society. All right? But we have both. All nations, even up until to the Roman period, depending on the prophecy, advice, and divine knowledge of these African priestesses, uttering the words of their African deities. All right? The words of those on the other side that work with the vessels of flesh that are connected in the spirit. All right? However, the identity of literally hundreds of these original divine African goddesses will never be known. Their prophecies and history stolen and plagiarized. Their African statues and faces destroyed or deliberately obscured Many overlaid with fake Arab, Greek, and Roman images. All of the images that we see of the goddesses uh, look like white folks. All right? They did that same thing with all of them. All right? Reflecting centuries of foreign invasion, cultural theft, and hostile occupations. Although the symbols were known to the non-African ancient world only as prophetesses, all throughout ancient Africa, they were revered as divine. The great mother healers, diviners, and sages who literally gave birth to the gods and aligned their people to their own personal destiny, divinity, and to their ancestors. The symbols were descendants of the first prehistoric matriarchal order of so-called serpent-worshipping clans of whom all African queens and queen mothers in the ecclesiastical order of priestesses and divine healers, artisans, and stone builders were born. All right? And that tied to what we read in Isaiah 4, while the Most High got to send his men to realign his daughters so that they can get back to doing everything that they used to do. All right, and we both will get back to where we was. All right, because in this society, the brothers got knocked all the way to the bottom. All right, and like the most I said, in the end of time, the women gonna rule over the men, but they not necessarily gonna rule over them in righteousness. All right, everything is about cycles. All right, the cycle of both of us running, the cycle of the women running, the cycle of the men running. The cycle under the Gentiles when the men got knocked all the way down, hung lynched, and all of that. All right? That was all part of our curses and punishment. All right? And the daughters got lifted up. The Gentiles put the sisters on a certain pedestal to where now they feel like they don't need the brothers. All right? And all of that is to break the unity. The same way they broke the unity on the spiritual side by teaching us that the teachings of voodoo and all that was evil, all right? It's to break everything with the Gentiles was to break the unity between the bodies of flesh and the bodies of light, all right? The deities that we was working with, all right? But now, at the end of time, the alignment, the unity is coming back together. And it's coming back through the divine mother aligning with the divine father and putting everything back in order, all right? Next, let's go into the handbook of Yoruba. Yoruba. Let's get a better understanding here. The indigenous Yoruba has a belief in the existence of a self-existent being 
who is believed to be responsible for the creation and maintenance of heaven and earth, of men and women, and who also brought into being divinities or deities and spirits who are believed to be functionaries in the theocratic world as well as intermediaries between mankind and the self-existent being. The Yoruba word for God is both Oludamare and Olorun. Aspirants are directed to see the Orishas as divinities of the Yoruba cosmology as well as the Voodoo cosmology and as emanations of Oludamare. The Orishas are emanations of Oludamare. Just like all of the angels in the Hebrew pantheon come from the Most High. All right? None of them are equal to the Most High. They are workers. All right? The Orishas aren't simply mythological constructs designed to satisfy the lower mind and intent of humans as divinities in angels and religious contexts they the orishas were created and sent by oludamare to assist in the spiritual and physical evolution and upliftment of humankind all right the same thing with the watchers in the hebrew pantheon in the Judeo-Christian culture, the word for angels signifies their work as messengers, but other words for angels signify their essence. They're called gods, the sons of God, ministers, servants, watchers, the holy ones. They constitute the court or government of the heavens or the spiritual realm. The Yoruba concept of ancestors and Orishas as messengers of Oludamare was in effect thousands of years prior to Judaism and Christianity. Native people throughout the world speak of being shown how to farm, domesticate animals, perform rituals, build temples, etc., by holy messengers, best described as gods or demigods. Ancient people of all world cultures depict these supernatural beings as seen through cultural eyes. The reality of angelic or dimensional entities is fortified by faith. The reality of angelic or dimensional entities is fortified by faith and conviction in the Yoruba religious system then the Yoruba spiritual system rather one must believe in the Orishas in order to ascend to God consciousness this is just like in the keys in the keys when they tell us about the emissaries of light all right, and how they work with man in the flesh to elevate them. And how those on the other side are truly the ones to open up the crystal sea, the mind's eye. We can't open it on our own. We got to work with those on the other side. And when they see we are ready, then they open us and they elevate us. All right. In the Yoruba spiritual system, one must believe, basically, is the whole indigenous spiritual system. One must believe in the Arishas or those on the other side in order to ascend to God consciousness, Christ consciousness, Haru consciousness, higher consciousness, and to reach the divine state of a human being. All right, and here go a chart showing how the similarities between the different Orishas. Or the Loa. All right. All of our ancient systems tied together. All right. We had a unity between our systems. And you see at the bottom, Olokun was Mami Wata. All right. 
Let's keep going. The Orishas are manifestations of heaven sent to continually wrestle with the human nature in order to uplift it, to purify it. The Ajogun are the demonic beings. All right. So the Orishas are on the right hand side and the Ojogun are on the left hand side. But they both are necessary to uplift and purify creation. The Ojagun are the demonic beings. They are earthly and heavenly forces whose destructive intent is to keep us earthbound, waylay our evolution, and offset our salvation. The Yoruba contend that the study of nature is foremost. The study of nature. The earthly mother and her elements is foremost. Nature is viewed as the manifestation of Olu Damare, or God through infinite degrees of material and spiritual substance. That essence, translated as I say, is the inherent force of all creation. The emphasis of such study or worship isn't centered on the physical object or the tangible, which you can see, but on the life force and energy and consciousness that brings about its form. Pause. All right. So this is how we get caught up thinking everything's idolatry, not understanding our natural ways. All right. We didn't worship the tree or the animal. No, it was the energy. It was the presence. It was the life force that was within it that we was connected with, that we understood, all right? Before we was completely blinded and remolded that had a Gentile view of everything. The emphasis of such study or worship isn't centered on the physical object, but on the life force and energy and the consciousness that brings about its form. The tangible object is but a symbol of the eternal existence that created it. Oludamare is also called Obatayis, the Lord who corrects wrongs on earth. Oba Adaida, the creator of all beings. Olorun, the owner of heaven, of heaven. Elada, creator. Elami. Owner of the breath of life. Oludamare or Edumare is in all things, is in all things, as the I say is the primal essence of all things. It's not the tree, the rock, the statue that African ancestors revered and worshiped, but the deep energy that brought about his being. And what that object specifically refers to on a cultural, historical belief reality. We understood that there was a spirit within all things in nature. Everything that has life has the spirit of Jaja and Mama Ja within it. All right. And it kept us in alignment. We kept the unity flowing between us and everything in creation. But like we read in the first book, the patriarchy, the Gentiles and them, they disconnected us from the earthly mother and all of her creations. All right, so next, let's go into spiritual warriors and healers. Let's get it from the comedic perspective. And remember what we just read about nature. All right. How Olu Damari ties in the nature. The nature. All right. The nature is the all. And what this doing is helping us understand the most high. All right. The creator, the supreme, is separate from the creation. All right. This is all helping us get a better understanding. When we talk about the most high or whatnot, 
we got to get past the Gentile understanding of the Most High as a as some something with manly attributes. Cause that that's that's not true. All right, that's a distortion, and that is stunting some of our growth. Because as we grow and going through these different books, we try to fit everything into that Gentile mindset that's been installed in us. But it's a growing process. So the Most High is, is not a man. He don't. The Most High, the, the Supreme, Jaja and Mama Ja do not have feelings that we got on this plane that we own. All right, nah. These feelings will dim your light. Because at the end of the day, we light. We beings of light. The nature is the all. Everything that the human mind can conceive is part of the nature. And remember, we just read, Olu Damari is in everything in creation. And everything that is incomprehensible, invisible, and even inconceivable is also part of the nature. And you see how closely the word nature and nature go hand in hand. The nature is the plants, the air, the mountains, the cosmos, the smallest microorganisms, the waters, the heartbeat, the thought, and even your dreams. The nature is all time and all space in the not yet existing time and space. This is also an aspect of divine dic dictonomy. It is the infinite all or the infinite one. The nature is nameless, hidden, formless, indefinableness, infinite consciousness, the supreme infinite consciousness, a self-existent, self-perpetuating force that created energy. It is intangible, and yet its breath is life. It breathes its life in all of us. It is the nature, the most high, the supreme, omnipotent power is pure consciousness. It is intelligence underlying and supporting all manner and all existence. The nature is the parents, father, father God, and the mother of existence. The nature, the supreme being, is the parents, the father and mother of existence. Everything in creation has masculine and feminine aspects. The plants, the animals, the insects, everything, seeds, everything has, is built off of masculine energy and feminine energy. Masculine principles, feminine principles, all right? There's always going to be more feminine principles and feminine energy than masculine because masculine tends to become destructive. A lot of the sisters out here got too much masculine energy now and it's becoming destructive. And that's why they acting like the men out here. They acting like the niggas. They run around killing each other, fighting and destroying each other. And because the female rappers that's been put on the scene in authority are pumping out that masculine energy into the youth all right the, the the divine feminine aspects is disappearing no it, it's not no patriarchy over here no it's a balance we got both but everybody got to play their part sisters have to be sisters you can't be men you got to get rid of all of that masculine energy all right it it, it destroys the relationships between the males and females it destroys the harmony all right Men gotta act like men. The nature is the parents, father, and mother of existence. The nature is eternal, infinite, and endures forever. The nature cannot be understood in its totality. Not even the angels can understand the supreme, for its very essence is unknowable to humans in its physical form. The nature is everything, and everything is part of the nature. The creation of the universe is mental, held in the mind of the all, the greater intelligence, the nature. The nature is spirit. 
And being that the universe is mental, this is why we did many lessons talk about up here, this is the astral realm. When you close your eyes and you see that darkness right there, all, all bets is off. Anything is possible from right there. But until you learn you a spirit and how to tap into that realm right there, you can't fully utilize your powers the way you're supposed to. Because your body was created in such a way that you got everything you need with you. It's just we have been disconnected and been given carnal eyes. But up here, this is the astral realm, the darkness of the mind right there. You close your eyes, you can do all type of stuff, all right? But you gotta learn to work in that atmosphere within you. That's why Buddha and Krishna was heavy on teaching about meditation, all right? Because when you meditate, even in the Emerald Tablets of Thought, he talked about it. When you go into meditation and you go into that astral realm, you can start to alter the physical realm, all right? But we didn't show that in all the lessons. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. The nature is the underlying reality, the state of her root or Christ consciousness behind all events of the world. All right? And this is why I keep saying, when you see things on the TV, don't focus on the people, the arm of flesh. See what the spirit is portraying you. All right, see what the spirit is showing you. When you're looking at what the Gentiles is doing with all their empty talk, see what the spirit is saying. When you see the things with Kanye and Kyrie and stuff like that, what is the spirit revealing? Not what is the flesh doing and getting caught up like the people of the world on the arm of the flesh and this person and that person. No, what is the spirit showing you? Because the spirit talk to the spirits. All right, but those that are not in tune with the spirit can't hear what the spirit got to say. All right, so all they can do is go off of the things of the world in the arm of the flesh. All right, which keep them blind and in the illusion. The nature is the underlying reality, the state of her root consciousness behind all events of the world. The nature is that which is perceived and also the perceiver. Therefore, only the nature exists. Nature does not exist as a separate entity from the nature. The nature is nature. All right? The Most High is nature. The Supreme Being is nature. The soul of all things, including man, is not separate from nature, from Mother, Father, God, from the Supreme. We are the nature, as we're going to see as we go farther into the lesson. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. This is the spirit of the spiritual warrior. This is the spirit or the knowledge of the spiritual warrior. This is the mystery of mysteries that must be known, not only intellectually, but also spiritually. All philosophical, religious, and scientific ideas originate from this source, from the spirit. Spiritual warriors can only be healers when they have adopted the doctrine of Mayat, which is divine order in their life, mentally, physically, and spiritual harmony. This alignment allows you to see yourself as nature. In addition, when the spiritual warrior sees itself as nature, as one with the mother and father God, there is no fear. When there is no fear of death, life, and living, when there is no fear of death, life, and living becomes divine. Because through your fear of death, the Gentiles have control over you. Uh, let's keep eating. Let's go to the ancient of the ancient. Let's go to Hindu. Shakti. The realm of the divine mother. The realm of the divine mother. It's a good book. It go through all her different aspects. Hindu 
ah, Hindu philosophy asserts that the Brahmin is the supreme reality. All right. And we didn't did lessons on this in the past. The supreme consciousness, Brahmin. But it's just like we just read about the nature, the supreme reality. The Brahmin is the supreme reality underlying both the manifest and unmanifest states of being. It is an integrated state that is changeless, indivisible, without distinctions, and utterly beyond, utterly beyond human comprehension. It can be known only by the direct experience of penetrating and transcending the levels of the mind or levels of consciousness on the material plane. In this way, consciousness becomes aware of its own real underlying nature, which is also the nature of the supreme unmanifest. The individual spirit or Atman is a centralized or contracted expression of the Brahman. So the Atman is the Stasi, is the drop of the supreme. It contains the whole in a potential form though it is nothing but an expression of the supreme consciousness it is obscured by the limited psychological world of the individual when pure consciousness descends to the individual frame it begins to relate to its limited body and displays itself in different ways according to its inherent nature and thus, it plays its own distinct role in the drama of manifestation. Brahman is the uncaused cause of everything, the one source of all qualities and forms, though in itself it has no qualities and no forms. From this basic standpoint, Hinduism gives us the freedom to worship God in whatever shape appeals to us. Pause. But this right here is going to show how we've been taught backwards to where we see all these different gods and deities and Kemet and then the Hindu in India. And we think we've been made to think that them people is pagans and idolatrous and whatnot. But we we'll understand them all different different incarnate not incarnations but they different aspects of the supreme all right and it don't matter which one your spirit gravitates to because their job is to take you higher all right to elevate you and lift you up like we read in the yoruba book all right the different manifestations of the supreme is for your elevation and they don't jaja don't care mama ja do not care which means it takes for you to Come back home Long as you make it back Alright it, it, It's no wrong, it's no harm, no foul As long as your growth and your consciousness Is continuing to expand And increase Hinduism gives us the freedom To worship God In whatever shape appeals to us We are each Given liberty To accept any form of the divine That appeals to us as our personal aspect of reality, there is to our heart. The logic behind this stance is that that which is formless can take on any form. Pause. And this book right here is dope because it's wrote by a sister. The same sister that wrote the Krishna book that I showed a couple lessons ago. All right. It's a. Hold on. Hold on. Let me. Alright, so the sister Vanna Mali, she wrote this book The Complete Life of Krishna Alright She understands the divine Feminine aspect of creation Because it's all in our original Hindu teachings Alright, so when you read these books This book about the divine Mother, it's not coming from a male It's coming from one of our Sisters, alright From over there in the Orient From over in India all right, she didn't study for years, and now she understanding both is giving back the writing. So it's always good to read about the divine feminine 
from somebody that's walking in that energy. All right. We didn't read enough about the father from the man. You don't want to hear about the mother from a man. Nah, because a man not going to be as close as the woman. And we're going to say, if we go father in the lesson, the woman was made directly in the image of the divine mother. Whereas the sons was made more so in the image of the divine father, even though they got both within them. All right. We both got testosterone and estrogen running through us. But the masculine got more testosterone, the feminine got more estrogen, all right? The hormones, there's a difference, all right? But it's a balance, all right? Everything is to connect us more so that we can bring the two together as the two in one, all right? Why the Bible say, when you get married, let your two, let your flesh become one. It's one in the spirit. It's a balance. And that's how we supposed to be as a nation. In Zion, the two operate as the one. The males in Zion and the females in Zion, just don't take away your carnal perverted mindset. This don't have nothing to do with sex or lust. It's about the spirit. We want in the spirit. And the females operate in their divine mother aspect, and we operate in our divine father aspect. And together, we turn into the conquering line. We the supreme. We the force that can't be touched. All right? Oh, let's keep going. We are each given liberty to accept any form of the divine that appeals to us as our personal aspect of reality dearest to our heart. The logic behind this stance is that that which is formless can take on any form. This is the basis of the great tolerance found in the Hindu religion. Since the Brahmin is formless and qualityless, any form can be worshipped as its form. As the value Purana asserts, he who fanatically affirms the superiority of one deity or incarnation over another is a sinner. All right, because when you study Hindu, Krishna, who is the most beloved of all, but he was only an incarnation of Vishnu. All right? He was just one of many incarnations of Vishnu. All right? Because we've taught that the supreme, the deities, they incarnate over time. And when the masculine deity incarnate, so does the feminine. So Vishnu, Vishnu wife was the goddess Lakshmi. That's one of them. So when Krishna incarnated, Lakshmi incarnated also at the same time because they were sent back together knowing that they were going to link up on their mission all right because together they are one she boosts him and he boosts her all right according to hinduism the purpose of life is to return to the source from which we have come the embodied soul comes from the brahmin goes through the drama of his many lives his many incarnations and then at last desires to return to its origin. Like us right now. Our desire is to go back home. It's not to take over the world from the white man and start a new civilization. No, it's to go back to the source. All right. We don't care about the carnal things of the world. Indian philosophy is famous for its symbolism. And from ancient times, Indian pictorial representation of God took both male and female forms. Over time, the universal form of the motionless absolute came to be associated with the male form and the manifested energy of nature with the female form. The absolute and nature are therefore not two, but two in one. The two in one, like we just read about nature in the, in the Kemetic book, the same way we read about Olu Damare and Yoruba, it's the two in one, all right? The absolute in nature are therefore not two, but two in one. They are necessary to each other as complementary manifestations of the one. 
in the Skanda Paruna. All right, and this this is a book, one of the Vedic books. Indra, the king of the gods, asks Vishnu how the Brahmin is able to project itself as both male and female. Vishnu replies, listen, O Indra, the male and female are eternal principles. And you see I got yin and yang wrote over male and female. All right, so when you see the symbol of the yin and yang is symbolizing the two in one, the oneness of the two in one that must be in harmony and must be aligned. All right. The male and female, the yin and yang, are eternal principles involved in the projection of the universe. They are never separate. This two-in-one existence came to be known as Purusha and Prakriti, or Shiva and Shakti. It is something like the dynamo and the force that charges it. One is powerless without the other. And that's how the Gentiles have us to where we don't have power because they done separated us. All right? They done separated us. We don't operate as a team. It is something like the dynamo and the force that charges it. One is powerless without the other. Shiva and Shakti, yin and yang, are, oppos are polar opposites, inseparable but having a varying relative predominance under different directions. Shakti, or Devi, presupposes all forms of existing knowledge. She is the female creative aspect of the Brahmin. It is through her, through Shakti, or Devi, that the one becomes the many. She is ID Shakti, the primeval force, and the first emanation of power, the first emanation of power from the absolute Brahman. She is the womb of the universe. Shakti, the mother power or divine energy, has many forms and symbols. All beauty and all ugliness flow from her. She is Lakshmi, the auspicious bestower of booms and beauty. She is Saraswati, the giver of all wisdom and art. She is Triple Rasandari, the most beauteous in the three worlds. But she is also Kali, the destroyer. She is also Kali, the destroyer, whose wrath ignites the storm, the thunder, and the lightning. She is Mahishasura Marindi, killer of the demon Mahisha. She is Shandika, the terrible, who lets loose the typhoon, the flood, and the tidal wave. All right, and when you study in Kemet, when you go through the different aspects of the feminine and that you go through our set Hathor segment is is different aspects of the divine feminine all right you got certain ones that give off different energy of the divine feminine all right segment and Isis they both are aspects of the divine mother but they fulfill two different roles all right and that's the same thing she's showing right here the great devotee, the devotee has greater freedom when he conceives of God as mother. The great sage of Bengal, Sri Ramakrishna, said just as a child can force his demands on his mother, so a devotee can force his demands on God as mother. God's worship is said to have begun in ages long past among the ancient hunter-gatherer tribes of prehistoric India. All right, but when we study the history, we know that we was way more advanced because the original ones that went into India was the Nagas. They was way more advanced than hunter-gatherers. Archaeologists have unearthed goddess figures in the earliest strata of Indian settlements. 
God is worship kept on growing and growing until today it is a full-fledged sect with adherents among all the cults that exist in India. All right? And remember, all of the nations, the Psalms 83 nations, was against the originals. All right? So them over there, they also had that we was the original people in that land over there. All right? And that's why the Gentiles and others think that they had a hunter-gathering civilization, not knowing that, nah, nah, after we left the land of Mu, we went to India, ancient Hindustan. Those was Nagas that set up. The first Hindus was Nagas. We didn't show that in other lessons, all right? But our history has done been hid. And that's why these are the oldest teachings and that goddess religion that they had, it came from us. The goddess might have begun as a simple divinity of one universal goddess representing the earth deity, but she has slowly assumed different forms and different names until at last we have a whole pantheon of female goddesses with different functions or attributes. But we must understand that all of them are merely powers of the one universal shakti the one divine mother the worship of god as mother is found in all civilizations in egypt she was known as isis in babylon and assyria as ishtar in greece as demeter and in phagoria as sibyl judaism and later on islam put an end to mother worship in the Middle East. Christianity repressed it at first, but later came to venerate the Virgin Mary as the mother of God. All right, and that's symbolic also. Our first relationship with the world is through our mother. The earliest memory of any person is that of lying on his or her mother's lap and gazing into her love-filled eyes. And the mother is sent to the whole world of tenderness, love, nourishment, and care. She is the embodiment of security. She personifies the idea of love from which the child draws sustenance, comfort, protection, and nourishment. To transfer this concept to a cosmic being is a natural step which the ancients took. Therefore, we can understand that the concept of the Divine Mother is as old as life itself. It is only natural to think of divine, the Divine as the Cosmic Mother who loves all, nourishes all, cares for all, and protects all. Devi is the Divine Mother, the eternal womb of all creatures, human and animal. She cradles her children in her loving arms, suckles them, and nurtures them with her infinite love in all forms. Wherever you see maternal love in a bird or an animal or a human being, know that to be but an aspect of Devi's love for the universe. For she is the universal mother. The wonder is that this modern age seems to have forgotten the divine mother's very existence. This is the dark age, the Kali Yuga, in which our increasing engrossment with the physical side of life has torn us away from our metaphysical roots and alienated us from our divine mother. The ancients were nurtured by the milk of kindness that is always oozing from the breast of our Divine Mother. And that is why they had a sense of the higher purpose of human life. A sensibility that seems to be lost in this age. In terms of power, the Divine Mother has a dual aspect. One as Abhidaya or cosmic delusion as one as Vidaya or cosmic deliverance. She, she binds us with her bewildering Maya, her cosmic illusion. In this world play of birth, death, and an enjoyment, 
On the other hand, it is she who releases us from this wheel of existence. Artists have depicted her as holding a noose in one hand with which she binds us and the sword in the other which she cuts the knot. One who has become fed up with the vain and futile running about in the game of the world has only to turn to the Divine Mother and beg her to release him from it. She would do so if his desire is strong enough. Her grace is infinite. Her compassion and love for all human beings and especially for true seekers is indescribable. The Divine Mother is ever ready to take back the straying child into her arms. It is true that she is the one who has set about this momentary play of duality, this divine drama upon the stage of the physical universe. But she is ever ready to take back into her loving bosom those children who have lost interest in the play and have had enough. And that's where we at. We have lost interest in this divine play and here in the flesh and have had enough. The child was wandered far from the divine mother one day realizes that she is the only source of security and runs back to her and begs her to take her back into her arms. The divine mother opens her arms wide and the errant child jumps into them and regains their original bliss. Purusha is that which we cannot know or conceive. It is the supreme being, the transcendental power of Brahman. That which we know through our mind and senses is nothing but the manifestations of the Divine Mother. That which we know through our mind and senses is nothing but the manifestations of the Divine Mother. Everything that we can think of or know is the form of the goddess. But she has a transcendental aspect as well. She is not contained in this little universe of which the earth is a part with this sun and moon and countless stars and solar systems. All this is but an infinite speck in the vastness and infinity of the Divine Mother. Innumerable such universes have their rise and fall within her ample bosom. She is all-powerful in all manifestation through eternity and affinity. All right? What it's saying is the earthly mother is just one aspect of the divine mother. All right? And within the earthly mother, you got more aspects of the divine mother also aspects of the divine father the debbie bag of Vatsum, which is another book describes the divine mother as the mother of the trinity brahma vishnu and shiva these three dynamic manifestations of the absolute are all manifestations of adi shakti or the first force as Brahma Shakti, she manifests in the form of Saraswati. As Vishnu Shakti, she manifests in the form of Lakshmi. And as Shiva Shakti, she manifests in the form of Durga or Kali. These are not three distinct Devis, but the one energy of the Brahman worshiping three different manifestations. She is the creator of many worlds and universes. Numerous Brahmas, Vishnus, and Shivas have emanated from her. All right? Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. That's the trinity. Creator, preserver, and destroyer. All right? It's similar to Jehovah, Jesus, and Lucifer. All right, it's just different aspects. In her transcendental aspect, she is Prakriti or Para Brahma Swarupini in the form of the Absolute Brahman. Therefore, when we worship the Divine Mother, 
we are not only offering adorations to the supreme in its aspects of motherhood, but also adoring the supreme absolute. See, the aspect of the supreme power, by whose grace alone we shall be ultimately released from the darkness of ignorance and the bondage of Maya and taken to the abode of immortal knowledge, immortality, and bliss. Shakti, the divine feminine force. Now, let's go back into the keys. Let's go back into the keys to see the metaphysical aspects of how the mother in her age is part of us transitioning to the next age. All right, back to page 413 in the keys. Starting at verse 93. At this time, the righteous will understand that just as the Old Testament was the age of the Father, the New Testament was the age of the Son, this new age is the age of the Holy Spirit. Let's get a precept. Let's go to the second light superscript. The second light superscript called Thou Shall Be the Image. The second light superscript, Thou Shall Be the Image. And this book is on the same site that we order the keys from. Verse 28. The mysteries of ongoing creation are connected through the divine mother, Ima. The mysteries of ongoing creation. Pause. And remember at the beginning when I was saying how the brothers that deny the mother and the spirit cannot work with them. They they gonna get stuck. They gonna start sounding like a broken record, like the old preachers and like the Gentiles. All right, because the time frame is gonna surpass them. Because as we are in the midst of changing through the spirit, through the divine feminine principle, those that deny it and are stuck on doctrine and stuck on the ladder, ladder instead of moving with the spirit, are gonna get left behind. And that's why I'm saying right here, the mysteries of ongoing creation because we not finished we still in the ongoing process here the first atom to the last atom the first atom to the second atom the mysteries of ongoing creation are connected through the divine mother Ima, where each life form is established by her weaving of the fabric of life into new creative life experiences she does this out of her greater love, directing flowing streams of support and energy which nourish new systems of life. She also sends forth the similitude as the sustaining field that further weaves mirror-like pulsating patterns to sustain the image and keep it in its alignment with the divine source. All right. So the spirit is what allows us to continue to transform and move forward with creation. All right. But the ones that's not moving with the mother, the divine feminine principle, they going to get cut short. You're going to have to go back into the recycle bin so you can try again. At this time, the righteous will understand. That just as the Old Testament was the age of the Father, the New Testament was the age of the Son. This new age is the age of the Holy Spirit or the Divine Feminine. Let us now rejoice in these words. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But the power in heaven, as we have seen, comes from the moment. All right, let's keep going. Page 550. Furthermore, I saw the activation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the faithful 
who labor day and night to build the kingdom of God. Furthermore, I saw the activation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the faithful who labor day and night to build the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light. I understood how the righteous had to undergo public crucifixion, crucifixion and presenting the word of God. Yet even with the imperfections of the body and tongue, the spirit of God pours into the servant who sacrifices for the kingdom of light and understands Yahshua's words, Eli, Eli, Lama, Asabatani, my God, my God, why have I forsaken thee? The asterisk means the I thou relationship of the Son to the Father, similar to the I and I of Rastafari, I and I. The I thou relationship of the Son to the Father, where the Son represents the limitations of the flesh. Such a servant who is willing to sacrifice his body upon the cross of space and time is honored by the glory and the power of the Holy Spirit Shekinah in the moment of deliverance. 62. This testimony was the breaking open of a profound mystery and a lesson to each master and prophet or prophetess of Yahweh who comes into this world and realizes that the physical vehicle cannot complete its mission without the fullness of the higher Christ body of light in the collective efforts of the Father's hierarchy. I also saw and understood how the true outpouring of the Holy Spirit would be activated with the commissioned power of the Father. I also saw and understood how the true outpouring of the Holy Spirit would be activated with the commissioned power of the Father presented through the office of the Christ so that the dead could be raised and all manner of sickness be put away in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because the office of the Christ is those who working with the higher consciousness all right and those who working with the higher consciousness got the ability to open you back up to the spirit all right and once you get open back up to the spirit and she started to work with you it's going to help you to where you shouldn't have no reason that you should have sickness all right and all manner of sickness be put away in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All right? She teach you how to heal yourself. She teach you how to eat properly. All right? And would not to continuously eat because it's going to cause a problem. All right? She gives you knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Like our brother Solomon. All right? Just like Yahshua. All right? So that you can rise above and you can also get life to the dead. In the dry bones of the valley. I saw that the physical body without active spiritual gifts manifested on the earth plane through the power of the Holy Spirit could not marshal enough energy to evolve into the consciousness of light. Again, I saw that the physical bodies those without active spiritual gifts manifesting on the earth plane through the power of the Holy Spirit could not marshal or muster up enough energy to evolve into the consciousness of light or into the Kadman body of light. All right, so let's get a precept. Let's see how that worked. Even though we didn't show it in many lessons, how the Shekinah, all right, the Shekinah universe works on the microscopic level. All right, and everything within us transforms as our consciousness transforms.
Page 395. Page 395, starting at verse 1. This key gives the explanation of the resurrection of the dead. This key gives the explanation of the resurrection of the dead by claiming that all life is based upon the higher light co-structure. The greater intelligence by measuring the change in light emanations of the over self body. All right, when it's speaking on the greater intelligence, it's speaking on the entities on the other side. By measuring the change in light emanations of the over self body, a higher body of light, knows the exact chemical firings of all corresponding life pulses. It means they know where we at in our walk, which allow for the retransmission of new physical bodies based upon this archetypal code. In other words, at the day of graduation or judgment, both the physical embodiment of the oversaw and the light body oversaw come together to receive codings for the next level of soul growth based upon the harmony of the oversaw body within all it all based within based upon the harmony the oneness of the over self body within all of its molecular embodiments all right and remember how in the lesson we did on the shekinah universe the shekinah presence how she transformed us from the inside out and activate the light within us we must understand that every molecular form in the human body and every molecular form of motion structuring human thought throws off a radiation of light. Ooh, there it is. We must understand that every molecule in your body and every molecule of motion coming from your thoughts gives off a radiation of light. This light cold structure does not dissipate all right, and this tied to our aura, all right, that we give off. Remember that lesson we did in the chakras. This light code structure does not dissipate, but continues to be stored in the form of a unique light spectrum, which gives the overall harmony of the light as it is pulsated to be in the restoration of life itself and the reprogramming of itself and the reassembly of this meta material information. Verse 7. Thus, every molecule within the body continually projects light pulses which build up a light cold structure which is beyond the physical relativity. Again, every molecule within the body continually projects light pulses, which build up a light cold structure, which is beyond the physical relativity. This cold structure is used to reshape the next program of consciousness evolution. This is why we had to come away from the wickedness of the world. Every biochemical molecule must radiate and pulsate again and again as the body of flesh is pulsated into new envelopes of light. Every biochemical molecule must radiate and pulsate again and again, as the body of flesh is pulsated or transformed into new envelopes of light. Our envelope of light 
programs all of the light forces for the human DNA RNA structure. Remember the lessons when we talked about and showed in the keys how our thought forms is responsible for activating the so-called junk DNA. It's the spiritual aspects of the DNA that's been shut down by our carnal thought and by us being trapped in the darkness. All right, the fallen thought forms, those polluted thoughts, and by peace being took away from us, we can't transform and activate. That's why they go so hard with the programming, and that's why in Doctrine and Covenant, the Most I say, I will not say or spare one that remains in Babylon. Babylon is a state of confusion. All right, the state of duality, which keeps you separate from oneness with the light, oneness with your creator, oneness with your divine mother and divine father and your brothers and sisters on the other side of the veil. All right. Our envelope of light programs all of the light forces for the human DNA RNA structure. However, each envelope of light is equipped with the energy necessary to progress into other cycles of creation. Let's get a precept. Let's go to page 255. Page 255. The text of 1 Corinthians goes on to say something quite remarkable and identifies itself as a key of Kabbalah to the fourth power fulfilling this eternal key of Enoch. When it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42-45, so also is the resurrection or reprogramming of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised up in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised up in glory. It is sown in weakness, carnality. It is raised up in spiritual power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised up a spiritual body, the life form. If there's a physical body, there's also a spiritual one. There cannot be a materialization without the energy frequencies which allow for the materialization. Back to page 396, verse 11. We are formed out of thoughts. We are formed out of thoughts. You are that which you think. As a man thinks, so is he. We are formed out of thoughts which fill the weight of space and time into which being is cast. These thoughts give you your own unique space and time in the drama of incarnation. Let's go to page 442. Page 442. Starting at verse 15. The, the unfoldment of the divine mind's programs of light energy purification requires continuous, requires continuous formation restoration of the divine seeds of light. Through this unfoldment, the entropic regions of less desirable worlds are either restored or fall away as imperfect creation. In this expansion, there are two creations simultaneously occurring at all times. We should turn them the divine spiritual and the physical. Let's get a preach up. Let's go to the first light picture superscript. The first light picture superscript called Thou Shall Be the Light. Thou shall be the light as are thy brothers and sisters on the other side of the veil. As are the father and the eternal mothers. Verse 27. Ultimately, we become the offspring, the children, as experimental sons and daughters of the divine light, manifesting the sustaining power 
with thy greater celestial birthright. Ultimately, we become the offspring, the children, as experimental sons and daughters of the divine light, manifesting the sustaining power with our greater celestial birthright. This makes us direct participants in experimental realms of unfoldment through which we ultimately attain, we ultimately attain the nature of divine sonship and divine daughterhood. Evolving into our own aspects of the creative sustaining Godhead as divine fathers and divine mothers in experimental universes. That's what the sealed portion is coming at when they talk about the many fathers and the eternal mothers. Now, nah, that's what we're supposed to be transferring into. All right. That's rose that song and body. Let's go back. Back in the keys. Back to page 550. Verse 65. Enoch said to me, those who are not sufficiently prepared by the insights of the Holy Spirit will not be able to consciously participate with the first manifestations of the return of the masters and their spiritual vehicles of light. And as we move into the deliverance through the Holy Spirit, as we move into deliverance through your mother's presence of the Holy Spirit, there will be many who will see the signs in the heavens and believe. And there will be many who will look and cannot see. Furthermore, those who are not using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, those who are not using the gifts of the Divine Mother, will have their mind blanked out after a macabre experience. Let's get the definition of macabre. Macabre. The divine light vehicle used by the ultra terrestrial or angelic master beings to probe, reach, and transport the faithful into myriad dimensions of the divine mind. The macabre can take on many forms of brilliant bryolet in the physical worlds. The macabre vehicles are increasing. If y'all, any of y'all watch the, um, the Gentile brother, Mr. MBBB33, Here we go. he always show them, all right? He always show, and to the Gentiles, they, they won't hear, so they don't necessarily know, but they reporting on it. They showing it. They don't know that them, them the Merkaba vehicles, it look like twinkle, twinkle, little star, because they shine all different types of colors. All right, you see them twinkling and glistening, lights, pulsating lights, changing all type of colors. Those are the Merkaba vehicles. All right, and what it's saying right here, those who are not using the gifts of the Holy Spirit will have their mind blanked out after a macabre experience. This is done lest the physical mind be overloaded by the consciousness transference of data from higher intelligence. Let's read that definition one more time. The macabre, the divine light vehicle used by the ultra-terrestrial or angelic master beings to probe, reach, and transport the faithful into the myriad dimensions of the divine mind. Now let's go to page 347. Page 347. We're gonna start at page 346. The bottom of verse 46. The macabre has the ability to travel and translate man. 
The Merkaba had the ability to travel and translate man. The Merkaba uses the geometry of light and providing for time translation into other life zones comparable to the thresholds of the human experience. All right, let's go over verse 56. But before man can enter the macabre vehicles and be taken to other star dimensions, he must be sufficiently prepared for the great energies which emanate from the macabre vehicles. This is why we just read, those not prepared, mind will go blank. Only when man's consciousness is sufficiently prepared with the love of the Father to understand the purpose of macabre, can the vehicle open this energy portal to project the blue-white light, which can creates an energy field around the body to protect it against changes as the body is taken into the vehicle. On Wakanda, they showed them with this blue-white energy field that they talking about right here in the Keys, lifting the people up into the chariot. All right? It's the same thing. All right? Just like on the UFO movies, when you see that bright light come out of the chariots, and they lift beings up into the, the chariot. All right? That's what, it, that's what he's speaking on right here. All right? Uh, let's keep going. Verse 66, and I learned much regarding the consciousness evolution of the macabre vehicles whose sole purpose is to turn all grief into great joy and liberation. Thus I speak to you that you may know the secret of hidden things within the chamber of living light and that you may ascend as servants of the living word up the spiral staircase of crystal energy into the vehicles of Melchizedek, wherein the faith of all ages may reveal, be revealed as the true and living faith of Israel. The Merkaba vehicle works with the Natumid, the eternal light. It works with the Shekinah, the inner universe working with the extended presence of the Father. It also works with the lords of light and the sons of light and daughters of light who collectively work as the 144 masters of the Christ consciousness who bring forth redemptive energy. And you accept it by asking that the higher intelligence, those on the other side working with Yahweh, the eternal mind, come into you and use you as light unto your fellow man. You must empty yourself of the confusions of the world, meaning the Babylon system and Satan's plan, and ask the Father to pour his light into your garment of flesh, or to ask the mother to pour her wisdom and light into your garment of flesh. Then you will actually feel the body of light consciousness come into you. Once you have balanced your field and have removed yourself from all of the negative influences of the antiverse, which holds you locked in space, all of the negative thought forms, the negative programming, the lovey-dovey emotions keep you locked in space. When you are balanced and have removed yourself from the negativity of the antiverse, when you experience the gematrian body of light consciousness, pause, let's get the definition. Gematrian body of light. The vehicle of light synthesis, light alignment in the body formed by the Shekinah's life forces which controls all the inner, the inner, the inside, the chakras, the auras, the inner relationships of light. This body prepares the human vehicle to be connected with the Christ body over self, 
On the physical plane, it can control the ratio between the plasmic state of living things and atomic molecular matter. The Gematrian body is made up of light geometries used in consciousness creation, inspiration, healing, etc., which can mathematically arrange each of the energy meridians of the human system to make them available to guide and energize the body. The Gematrian body with the Shekinah bears witness that we are active people of God, children of light. The Gematrian body of light with the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, the presence of the mother, bears witness that we are active people of God and actively dwelling in a body of light within the body of flesh. Back to verse 74. When you are balanced and have removed yourself from the negativity of the anti-verse, when you experience the gematrian body of light consciousness, then you will be able to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit within you and you will commune with the Lords of Light through the Merkaba. All of this is preparing us for what's to come. All right, we see the signs of the times. Jaja then gave us the lessons. The show was about to happen, the time frame, the things to look for. And if you can't see no other sign, as long as you can see that all of the rivers around the world is drying up, which means Babylon's system is about to fall because the merchants, like it talks about in Revelation 19 or 18, the merchants of Babylon are not going to be able to deliver their product. All right, as those rivers dry up. But let's keep going. Let's keep eating. We ain't done. The gospel of the Nazarenes. The gospel of the Nazarenes. The original Aramaic Matthew. Starting on page 51. In that hour, Yahshua, Yahawashah, Yeshia, Emmanuel, Matzah, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, all parent, all parent, all parent of the highest heavens and earth, that thou hast hidden these things from the worldly and hast revealed them unto the babe. All these things are delivered to me of the Lord Creator. And no man knows the offspring but the all parent. Nor no one knows who the all parent is but the son, even the daughter, meaning the sons and daughters of light, and they to whom the sons and daughters of the all parent. The all parent being the light, the source, the, and only the ones that will know the all parent is they to whom the sons and daughters of light will reveal it. Those who are not sons and daughters of light are stuck on doctrine. They still children of the flesh. They cannot reveal the all parent. Page 121. Then said they to him, Where is your father and your mother? Yahshua answered, You neither know me nor my parents. If you had known me, you would know my father and my mother also. And one said, Show us the father, show us the mother, and we will believe you. And he answered, saying, if you have seen your brother and felt his love, you have seen the father. If you have seen your sister and felt her love, 
you have seen the mother. Far and near, the all parent knows his own. Yes, and each of you, the fatherhood and the motherhood may be seen. For the father and mother are one. The father and mother are one. Father God and mother God are one in the all parent. Let's get a precept. Let's go to the fifth light picture super scroll. The fifth light picture super scroll. This one's called here. Called Thou Shall Be the Family. Thou Shall Be the Family. The only way to be the family is to know your position and play your role. You got to get back in the image and likeness that you were set up in. Homosexuality is confusion. That's the Babylon spirit. No, there's no confusion in the kingdom. Verse 361. It also starts by honoring our heavenly father and mother beginning with the divine father Abba and the divine mother Ema then extending to our heavenly parents who are our true spiritual parents speaking on the father and the eternal mothers existing in the heavenly realms then in turn extending to our parents upon the earth Verse 368, specifically, the more you come to know your spiritual parents in the true heavenly family of your light emanation, the more you become linked to the presence of the realms of light from Abba Elayah and Ima Elayah to the spirit of Yahweh. Now let's, let's go back and read. Let's go back to verse 253. Abba Ilayah means the higher father. All right. He is said to also be present with the higher mother known as Ima Ilayah. All right. So Abba Ilayah and Ima Ilayah is the all parent, the highest. Now let's go back to the gospel of the Nazarenes. Let's go to verse page 160. And this chapter is called Jesus Teaches in the Palm Circle the unity of all things. And without truly understanding the Most High, the Supreme Being that permeates all creation, you can't understand the unity of all things. Without getting rid of the Gentile state of mind, you can't understand the unity of all things. And this also shows why Jesus taught in this book we not supposed to be eating the animals. All right? The divine feminine, the divine father also is in the animals. All right? They also got a purpose here. That's why in the Bible it's in the end of time. Animals, not even going to eat animals. All right? But let's keep going. Starting at verse 2. If one of them said, Teacher, it is written of old, the Elohim made man in their own image. Male and female created they them. How can you say then that the Lord is one? And Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you, in the Lord, there is neither male nor female, and yet both are one. And the Lord is the two in one. He is she, and she is he. The Lord is perfect, infinite, in one. Pause. Do you see how all of the religions, we done went through the Yoruba pantheon, we done went through the Kemetic pantheon, we then went through the Hindu pantheon and the Hebrew. All right. And right here, the two and one. That's in the comedic with Netzer, 
as the mother and the father we seen in the Shakti book that the Brahmin is the two in one and right here Yahshua teaching the Lord is the two in one verse 3 as in the man the father is manifest and the mother hidden so in the woman the mother is manifest and the father hidden Therefore, should the name of the father and the mother be equally hallowed. For they are the great powers of the Almighty. And the one is not without the other in the one Lord. The Lord is above you, beneath you, on your right hand, on your left hand. Before you, behind you, around you, within you, and without you. Verily, there is but one Lord. Who is all in all. And in whom all things do consist. The fountain of all life and all substance. Without beginning and without end. Unbegotten. The things which are seen and pass away. Are manifestations of the unseen. Which are eternal. That from the visible things of nature. You may reach to the invisible things of the spirit. And by that which is material attain to that which is spiritual. Verily, the Elohim created man in the divine image, male and female. Therefore is the Lord both male and female. Not divided, not divided, but the two in one, undivided and eternal. By whom and in whom are all things, visible and invisible. From the eternal they flow, to the eternal they return. The spirit, the small spirit, to big spirit. Soul to soul. Mind to mind. Sense to sense. Life to life. Form to form. Dust to dust. In the beginning, the Lord created will, and there came forth the beloved son and daughter. The beloved son and daughter. Holy wisdom and divine love. Equally proceeded from the one eternal fountain. And of these are the generations of the spirits of the Most High. And the sons and daughters of the eternal. And these descend to earth. And dwell with men. And teach them the way of the Lord. To love the law of the eternal. And obey it. That in it they may find salvation. Many nations have seen their day. Under diverse names have they been revealed to them. And they have rejoiced in their light. And even now they come again to you. But Israel receives them not. Verily I say to you, my twelve whom I had chosen, that which has been taught by them of old time is true, though corrupted by the foolish imaginations of men. Again, Yahshua spoke to Mary Magdalene, saying, It is written in the law. Whosoever leaves father or mother, let him die to death. Now the law speaks not of the parents of this life, but of the indweller of light, which is in us. Now the law speaks not of the parents of this life, the parents of the flesh, but of the indweller of light, the divine father, the divine mother, mother, father, God. Which is in us. Whoso therefore forsakes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Law. And the body of the elect. Let them be lost. In the outer darkness. For they so willed it. None. Can hinder. The law. Now. That we got that understanding. The two in one. The father. Is the aspect of the son. 
And the mother is the aspect of the daughter. When the sons and daughters are walking in their light, that's when they produce the super seeds. All right? That's when you bring forth the super celestial seeds like Yahshua. All right? And that's why we got to get past the lie of the Gentiles about Yahshua being born from a spirit. Let's eat on that. The world going to put some respect on our brother Joseph's name. Because they disrespect Joseph. They took Joseph credit and gave it to a spirit. It broke up the unity. All right? And it was fulfilled. It was really to fulfill their mission with white Jesus. All right? But in our teachings, we understood. The male walks in the image of the father. The daughter walks in the image of the mother. And together, that's how they create the super seeds. Oh, let's go to the chapter called The Immaculate Conception of Yahshua the Nazarene. Verse 2. Now Joseph was of a just and rational mind, and he was skilled in all manner of work and wood and stone. And Mary was a tender and discerning soul, and she wrought bells for the temple. And they were both they were both pure before the Lord. Joseph was pure before the Lord, as was Mary. They were both walking in their divine light. And the angel came to her and said, Hail Mary, you are highly favored, for the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed be the fruit of your womb. Verse 6, the Holy Spirit shall come upon Joseph, thy spouse, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, O Mary. Therefore also that Holy One which shall be born of you shall be called the Messiah. And his name on earth shall be called Jesus, for he shall save the people. Really his name shall be called Yahshua, for he shall save the people from their sins. Whoever should repent and follow in the way of the law. Verse 9. And in the same day, the angel Gabriel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said to him, Hail Joseph, you that are highly favored, for the Lord is with you. Blessed are you, Joseph, among men, and blessed be the fruit of your loins. And as Joseph thought upon these words, he was troubled. And Gabriel said to him, Fear not, Joseph, son of David, for you have found favor with your creator. And behold, you shall beget a child and shall call his name Yahshua, for he shall help save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was written in the prophet saying, Behold, a maiden shall conceive and be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and his title shall be Emmanuel, which interpreted is the Lord within us. The Lord within us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel bid him, and went into marriage. He went into marriage, his espoused bride, and she conceived. Do you see the unity? Because they was connected. In the spirit, they was connected with the beings on the other side. And the beings on the other side came through the astral realm in the sleep and spoke to each of them. And the angel, Gabriel, came and told Joseph, Wake up and go on into marriage so that we can get this process rolling. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel had told him. And he went into marriage, his espoused bride, and she conceived. 
Now let's go back to the keys. Back to the keys. Page 143, starting at verse 33. Enoch told me that the children who will be born of highly spiritual parents would not come into the world under the influences of the old zodiac. Maseroth cycle but will be born with karmic release knowing that they had direct communication with the father's kingdom and that's what Yahshua had these children will be incarnated with the specific purpose to serve the remnant seed of the world and to prepare that remnant seed with great powers a spiritual fusion which will pour out of their super minds because their minds will be connected with those on the other side of the veil. Alright? So they are links in the flesh to bring forth the kingdom of light upon the earth like Yahshua did. Alright? But they only come when the man and woman are connected as one in the spirit, connected with the mother aspect of the divinity and the father aspect of the divinity. Mother, father, God, the supreme being, the two in one that permeates everything within creation from the luminaries in the sky to the angels, deities, orishas on the other side of the veil, coming down to those incarnated in the flesh. Animals as well as people and everything else that you can see in creation is an aspect of Abba Elaya and Ima Elaya. And that She'll put the puzzle pieces of everything we've been learning into proper perspective. You apply from that spiritual perspective. All right? Peace.